good good morning everybody good morning good afternoon good evening to all uh, welcome to sankal global summit 2021 we are here for the panel discussion on role of industry 4.0 technologies in building ecosystems for sustainable agriculture in the global south uh i would like to invite mr santosh singh who's the director of Cli clean energy climate change and agriculture at intellicap to moderate the session but uh, before we begin i would like to highlight a few housekeeping rules uh, we would request all the participants to keep yourself on mute uh, please ask the, your questions on the chat box and uh, please please feel free to introduce yourself and meet other participants in the chat box uh, it's always good to know who's who else is there in the session Thank you. Uh, over to you, Santosh. Thank you, Ajay, and a very warm welcome to all the participants and to uh, the panel. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, uh, respective of your time zone. Uh, we would be having this session for ninety minutes, and I'll give you a quick context. We are just a couple of minutes behind the schedule, and we are awaiting one of our panelists to uh, join. You know. Uh, but I think while we are wait for uh, the panelists to kind of be here, uh, let me just give you a quick context of this discussion so that uh, you know uh, we start connecting what could be the next ninety minutes for uh, this discussion. Uh, and and as uh, you know, uh, Ajay pointed out uh, the housekeeping rule. One of the thing that while we do have a, a twenty twenty five minutes mark for the uh, question and answer after the discussion, but I would request everyone to kind of put the questions into the chat box, and we'll try to kind of uh, answer the questions. Or, and the speakers are also keen to engage in the conversation while we have the session ongoing. So with that, I think uh, uh, Sujit, uh, should we start? Uh, let me see if I have. Uh, yeah, Santosh, I think uh, you can start. We'll uh, slowly, like uh, as he comes in, we'll bring him into the conversation. Perfect. Perfect. So, so, so uh, you just uh, remind me, and then I can uh, kind of uh, take that note. Definitely. So, so I think, uh, yeah. So, uh, I think uh, the panel today we have, uh, you know, three panelists. Uh, uh, unfortunately, one of our panelists is not well, so she has to pull in the last minute. Uh, Srivali would not be joining, but we have uh, Mr. Parmesa from the World Bank, who leads the EgTech uh, work at the World Bank. We have. Uh, Siram Bhartam from Kuja, and we have Nixon from Agra, who is going to be here in a couple of minutes. So uh, the today's discussion is primarily focused around what we call the, uh, you know, agriculture 4.0. I, I think we are moving beyond the egg tech because egg tech uh, is kind of uh, well described, well debated, and a lot of uh, intervention doing that. But we are taking the discussion to be more futuristic, and we're talking about what could be the agriculture 4.0 or what could be the cutting edge technology that could transform the agriculture. Uh, just to put the thing in a context, if you look at the global agri-tech market, uh, you know, this market is projected to be around $41 billion by 2027. So uh, this event, we are not talking about the cutting edge things that are still emerging. The market is really huge. But what is exciting about that, that how we are looking at some of these uh, industry 4.0 technologies, which you know, in a very layman's word, we are talking about Internet of Things, cloud computing, artificial intelligence, blockchain-based contracts, and so many other things that are kind of on a horizon, uh, including the biotechnologies, uh, you know, frontier research that is happening. So we want to discuss the potential that these disruptive technologies have to either enhance the uh, resilience of the agriculture practices or enhance the productivity, technically just disrupt the whole agriculture the space for the you know global south or for the agriculture in general and you know in this context i think the way we have structured the panel discussion i'm going to ask each of the panelists to provide their initial remark which would cover the work that they are doing in this space and the potential of ag tech or the industry 4.4 technologies to kind of transform the work that they are doing but one key point I want to understand is that what is the big picture that we have for agriculture if all of these things uh, could disrupt the way we are visualizing? So uh, that would be the first thing into the uh, you know opening remark that will focus on. The second thing that we are looking at, what could be some of the huge cases for these you know disruptive technologies? I know that there are a lot of exciting work being done by the World Bank in partnership with many of the industry uh, stalwarts who are working with different technologies. Uh, Siram is doing very cutting edge work in getting those technologies to the ground and Agra has been doing a lot of work with different partners to take the technologies to solve some of the problems. 
of the farmers or of the ecosystem that is catering to the farmers. So that's the second part of the conversation we are focusing on what could be the different use cases. The third, uh, you know, uh, uh, set of uh, the third question that, or, or the point that I want to highlight is that is what are the critical barriers that we need to address in order to make this agriculture 4.0 uh, or, or technology 4.0 to come and you know transform the agriculture? What are the barriers that we need to overcome? Is the ecosystem there? Is the kind of pieces that need to be put together to make this happen are there? And the last part is that if we want to kind of achieve this, who are the different players in the ecosystem that need to come together? What could be their role and how they can work seamlessly? So that's the agenda for next, uh, you know, uh, 60, uh, 70 minutes. Uh, uh, I just want to check whether if I have Nixon on the call, otherwise I'll go and start with, I'll invite, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Parmesa to give the opening remark and talk about the a potential of agriculture 4.0 and how this can change the way we see agriculture and uh, some of the problems that are interested in agriculture today. Over to you, sir. Thanks a lot, Santosh, and uh, very good to be here today for this uh, interesting panel. So agriculture clearly is going through a massive transformation globally. Uh, and that is for two reasons. One is the data part which is, I think, the most important. I think uh, data processing earlier used to take a lot of time and there used to be a lot of collection of data, but it was not converted in insights, analytics, and use cases. And I think that's what is happening now more and more is that data is getting converted into uh, use cases and products and services. And I think this is what you see in India. This is what you see in Africa now increasingly happening. And what you see is the growth of ag tech startup is a, a function of that. And you can see the proliferation of startup. We did a report in Africa in 2019 and looked at how many scalable startups are there in Africa. And we found that there were at least 178 of them who were using this technology and data and, and digital technologies to create new kinds of products and services. Uh, so the second trend is what is happening to, because agriculture has been using a lot of devices for a very long time. We use solar, we use pumps, irrigation pumps, we use tractors. We have lots of devices there, which is, these are hard devices which are used by farmers and lots of people who are in the industry. But these devices have never talked to each other. You know, so the lot of data which could have been generated by the devices talking to each other was never connected. The devices were not connected. And the reason they were not connected is because of the technology. We also finished recently a report on 5G and agriculture. And we found that in lots of countries we are seeing these devices, digitization, data, all coming together to provide niche, rich insights for what could be done for agriculture. So the use of AI, machine learning, satellite data, and lots of other technologies which could process the data at almost six to eight times the speed at which it is being processed right now. Once you get data, then you spend more time on products and services. Currently, I think that is the major change which will happen through agriculture 4.0 is that data will be processed, analyzed, and converted into products and services and more customized offerings at a much rapid rate. Now, this has started happening for commercial large farmers and middle farmers in many parts of the world. You take Korea, you take Ireland, you take Netherlands, you take US, you take a lot of them significant number of farmers are already using customized data to take day-to-day -day decisions, which about, because the weather is very unpredictable. So you cannot now, previous ways by which the farmers would observe weather patterns and then take decisions are no longer valid. So you have to use a lot of insights, which you have to use that to do that. But the biggest challenge is now, how does agriculture 4.0 become inclusive for smallholders? It is not an automatic thing that, uh, and, and the danger right now one sees is that there's a digital divide between uh, the farmers who are able to use data and insights 
and the farmers who are not able to use uh, that data. So that's why I think that will be the biggest uh, kind of challenge for us is how do we use Agriculture 4.0 4 for inclusive innovations there? So, uh, so I think if you look at the cases now, now you have uh, lots of products being developed for urban areas, which are already there. But I'll give you an example of one uh, case we are working on is with Mineral X in Google. So we are looking at how we can create a Google map kind of an architecture, universal architecture open source architecture, where you could put the coordinates of a farm or put the name, and then you will get the, you know, that uh, particular farm uh, characteristics and all available to you. So that people don't have to spend a lot of time on collecting granular data, uh, which, which I think if you see mobility has increased so significantly because of Google Maps, but we don't have something equivalent in agriculture, which will allow an open access to certain uh, good, uh, you know, data, which is available to almost everyone, whether it's a startup in Africa or a startup in any, and, and so, but I think the biggest constraint is that we haven't digitized a lot of data in agriculture uh, globally. If you look at edutech, if you look at health tech, it, I think it's growing much faster, uh, the use of AI and machine learning. Agriculture is difficult because it's very location specific. And uh, to create a location specific data into a universal kind of a data platform is more difficult to do that. Uh, second kind of thing is the use of sensors. Now, clearly you can see that irrigation has seen a lot of use of sensors for water and a lot of remote controlled uh, use of water in which the farmer doesn't even go to the, even, even in India and lots of parts, this is happening right now that farmers are able to use data for water to have more precision irrigation out of that. That is becoming very common. Now, similarly, it's the question of precision uh, fertilization, precision, uh, you know, uh, use selective use of pesticides so that you are not uh, using indiscriminately pesticides there. So I think the precision agriculture part is going to be huge in case of, uh, uh, as we go for uh, agriculture 4.0. You know, in, so the Korea has now so many smart farms who did, who are able to assess what are the diseases even before they start occurring through analysis of data. They see even the patterns which are happening, micro patterns through AI and blockchain. And they have developed a blockchain based tool which allows every farmer to act on disease before it becomes, uh, you know, difficult to do that. So I think uh, uh, this uh, pest, uh, you know, uh, ex, uh, management, uh, livestock management, and all will become very different as we go for and uh, developing these products. So soils is also a very important part. You know, sensors in in a lot of soils, IoT devices there, uh, IoT devices on tractors, IoT devices on irrigation devices. So once we have a network of sensors and we have satellite data together with that, the information will be available at a much higher rate and uh, data will be available at much higher rate, which allows products to be better quality, customized and uh, available to the farmers at a, at a very lower cost than what it is available right now. And I think that is going to change and revolutionize the way uh, agriculture 4.0 is going to work on that. So I'll stop there and uh, hand it over back to you. So, so thank you, sir. I think uh, uh, I have a couple of follow-up questions. We'll come back to them, uh, you know, uh, in my second uh, round of questions. Is basically on the sensors and how, uh, what sensors can do. Because uh, one of the key things is that how to use the sensors to solve some of the bigger problems that we're facing. But, you know, I'm, I'm moving on to Sriram. So Sriram, I think, uh, uh, you know, Parmesar has given a good overview of what these technologies can do. And, and, and you have been working on deploying these technologies on the ground. So over to you to hear about your perspective on how agriculture 4.0 can transform the agriculture or, or what are the kind of new technologies that have the potential and how we are going to uh, make them available uh, uh, to the farmers or to the agriculture uh, sector stakeholders. Santosh, thank you so much for this opportunity. 
Uh, I want to just step back a minute and just give a perspective of where we are coming in as Kusa. As Kusa, we are creating opportunities for youth, women, and small business owners to learn, connect, and grow in the rural areas on their own terms and pace. And why I'm highlighting this is it's extremely important keeping in mind the three core challenges. One, we are talking of about 500 million plus smallholder farmers across Africa, Asia, and parts of South America who are, yes, they are the customers and that's the reason why we are all in the business, but they don't know what they don't know. And they are struggling because the current extension network systems are very poor and quoting some of the countries in East Africa, the ratio of a public sector extension worker to farmers is about one to 5,000 on an average. While as you know, the recommended ratio by FAO is one to 400. Now the service providers who have excellent technologies, excellent products and services are finding it extremely difficult and expensive to reach and serve these smallholder farmers who are in remote parts. And the third is government and the public and policy uh, or, uh, decision makers don't have the data, like Parmesh just explained. The data is a scarce resource right now and nobody really has a single source of truth. When we looked at all of these dimensions, we saw a problem and an opportunity. The increasing uh, the rural unemployment side of it. So we looked at the rural unemployed youth and then said, is there a way we can shape them or give them a set of skill sets with which we can make them do two things. One, provide extension services locally. And second, be the carriers of change and be the ones who are the carriers of this technology and these innovative products and services to the farmers. So we created a movement, uh, we call this agripreneurs, agriculture entrepreneurs. And we are consciously working towards making rural unemployed youth as agriculture entrepreneurs. They are not agronomists, they are not trained agriculturists, but we are equipping them with one, the skills of business of agriculture, and second, giving them portable digital kits and first thing that we did is we digitized about 42 agriculture value chains, both crops and livestock, in about 10 languages and making them available in bite-sized micro-learning videos. And why I'm emphasizing this is everyone is becoming time poor. They don't have the time. And when there's a pest attack, like Parmesh just explained, that is the time when a farmer is actually willing to listen because end of the day, they need to take an action. While there are a lot of technologies available, but it is the time when they need to understand what is going, what's happening, and what is the necessary action they need to take. And that's what these youth agripreneurs are able to provide and also generate the demand for other products and services. So this is where we are actually seeing that there is a massive shift coming in. Currently, we are operating in three countries, and there's a deliberate design that we picked up these specific countries. One, we are working across 10 Indian states, and we started off in Bihar and Jharkhand. We said, you know, if it can succeed in these difficult territories, it can succeed in elsewhere. Then we are also operating in Mozambique, which is quite a uh, difficult terrain and a vast terrain. And then we are consolidating all our learnings in the Kenyan market by trying to bring all the service providers and all the ecosystem actors together onto one common platform, trying to see how we can make a difference here. Uh, let me pause here and pass it back to you, Santosh. So, so I would ask you to kind of uh, deliberate a bit more because since you are creating those entrepreneurs and and you know uh, providing those solutions to the farmers, you know, so technically once we have these four point oh driven technologies uh, become available, you can be the conduit to deploying them into the ground, right? So uh, taking that you know in, in insight that you have, what are the kind of some of the critical needs for the solution? Because I see technologies are driving those solutions. So because uh, you know, a machine learning itself is not of any use to the farmer. It solves certain problems. So in your case, when you're looking at the farmer's need for those solutions, where do you see that there is a need for new kind of solution to come up? And how do you see that whether those solutions are in the pipeline or those areas are still kind of open where we need to put more focus and enable that? For example, the example, you know, uh, Parmesh talked about the, map the data being kind of uh, a challenge if that is available could we see a new generation of technologies or new ways of solving the problem happen? so two you know kind of dimension that i want you to uh, provide perspective on one is that what are the problems that you see are still 
not being solved in the way they could have been and what are the technologies that could enhance your your you know uh, the solutions where you see those in the frontiers uh, that we can talk about yeah very interesting uh, question santosh uh, let me see if i can do a justice to that question uh, purely speaking from my own experience of having done this for years our journey so far has been very very challenging and also rewarding uh, we believe we are successful only when we are able to make a difference in the lives of these smallholder farmers now most of them as i said they don't know what they don't know yes they are, they are they are actually on an average if those very few small uh, farmers who have access to a smartphone they would have approximately 20 different apps on their phone and they really don't know which one is what and what what is credible and what is not leave the credibility beside so they really don't know which one they can take an action on so as my key message here is while there are so many technologies that exist like parmesh just said there are over 160 plus agtech innovators just on the continent about a couple of years ago and that's no 200 of them right now a lot of effort goes into educating the farmers and making these technologies one accessible second affordable and third available now when i say accessibility and affordability yes we need to bring down the cost of delivery of these technologies one majority of the smallholder farmers are not connected to this internet grid and leave alone internet grid we are talking of even the power grid now this is where an associated or a supporting system like having an agripreneur kind of a model of course agra also has a model which uh, nixon is going to speak about i'm sure but there are different models that are emerging which are agent based models but equipping the agents with the right toolkit so that they are in turn able to make them available to the farmers is one go to market approach and this i see is going to continue for some more years because of the lack of infrastructure and the second thing is there are a lot of point solutions exist but what is extremely important is as we all know agriculture is a science and the timely intervention is extremely important like parmesh spoke about the insights and intelligence a lot of data exists which in a sense if we are not able to translate into insights and intelligence and drive the actionable intelligence which is what a farmer needs to take an action on is something where a lot of emphasis needs to go in so we are coming from the grassroots level and that's where our emphasis is on and we've started an initiative uh, called one network a one network is an initiative where we are bringing in multiple digital service providers and thanks to the initiative called disrupt to agriculture technologies uh, led by the world bank under the leadership of uh, parmesh about 20 different innovators have been brought together across different verticals like data inputs aggregation markets and also on the <clears throat> the market side so we are integrating all of them and we are working towards a common goal called a 1 million farmer platform that's that's the basis that's like the true north for us in the next couple of years we want to get there by bringing in the strengths of all the innovators and also the traditional players like the large input companies of takers and buyers and taking an ecosystem approach with a very strong belief that you know we can make a difference and currently the model is already scaled in kenya we are currently working in 27 counties it started with about 16 scaled to 27 and going up to 45 counties and i'm sure in the next 12 to 18 months we'll start seeing some of these technologies being used at scale thank you santosh thanks sir ram so uh, you know i have uh, my uh, another panelist nixon here i think uh, uh nixon uh, you know is working with uh, uh agra uh, and nixon if you can hear me uh, and you can just yeah perfect yes i can hear you sorry for joining a bit late no problem so so uh, nixon is a senior program officer with uh, digital systems and solution for agriculture at the alliance of green revolution popularly known as agra and and he had been working on the ground to deploy many of these agriculture interventions with different uh, you know partners and you know uh, nixon uh, you know in your opening remark what i want to understand is that africa has seen a number of interventions in the agriculture space driven by the ag tech and the new generation technologies at the same time the digital divide is very stark and many of the you know farmers are not even able to uh, get the digital uh, basic services to kind of benefit from these things so 
you know, when you look at the potential of egg tech in transforming the agriculture in Africa, what you see as, you know, kind of the potential and opportunities that you have and some insight from the work that you are doing uh, in those uh, parts of the, uh, you know, uh, world. Over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, Santos, uh, for this opportunity and uh, apologies for joining late. Um, one is that, um, you know, as AGRA, we are basically, uh, if you know how AGRA was formed, you know, uh, right from uh, the experience of the Asian Green Revolution, which ended in 1990 uh, and was really credited on with uh, resolving some food crises and reducing, you know, poverty um, and offering potential important, uh, you know, lesson for, 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 you know, sub-Saharan countries. Uh, and, and taking a cue from the, you know, the Asian green uh, revolution, um, the African, uh, you know, agriculture policy makers with support of donors like Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, USAID and, uh, you know, MasterCard Foundation proposed, you know, an um, African green revolution or where improved seeds and fertilizers really were uh, to drive, uh, you know, this process. And uh, of course, this led to the creation of uh, what we now call Agra Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa in the year 2006. And uh, the main, um, you know, uh, issue around this was to really uh, look at how to improve, uh, uh, you know, reduce poverty uh, and also resolve uh, food crisis uh, uh, within Africa. Now, within Agra, Mm, just as you have asked, we we have developed uh, you know a digital strategy really with the purpose to integrate you know uh, digital excellency into the programs that we run and uh, really improve uh, farmers' livelihood um, and 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 this and this seeks to make it easier for you know farmers to access uh, inputs and other farming uh, technology. And uh, we as Agra really aim to promote digital as enabler, uh, you know, for con con to connect agriculture ecosystem, uh, sustainability, integrating of course government, market uh, and, and villages really where um, agriculture takes place. So there are a number of um, um, uh, partners that we have worked with on, on different levels. Um, one is uh, we're working with uh, IBM and one of our our grantees uh, called Kikumwe in Rwanda uh, to really look at quality and standard to link farmers to predictable markets. Uh, so we are currently engaging IBM uh, to uh, work with our partners on logistic uh, solution, essentially. Uh, looking at supplies that meet, uh, you know, uh, premium uh, buyers. Uh, this is simply um, with the use of, uh, you know, artificial intelligent technology to kind of try and locate uh, maize for supply uh, and uh, uh, for, for, for ease of, uh, you know, off takers to, to get it to the market. Um, and, and really the goal of this project is to utilize technology and data which is both AI and satellite data to kind of uh, you know support uh, our grantee scheme to connect uh, uh, you know off takers to to the maze. And then the other uh, intervention we have done is also uh, trying to reach uh, you know the last mile through technology, and we are partnering with Microsoft uh, uh, um, on uh, on this. Um, to try and provide digital extension and services uh, via, you know, low form technology like SMS and WhatsApp. Uh, and the aim is really to support the extension services uh, to the village based advisors um, model that we use um, uh, in the uh, in the agri existing, you know, uh, network. Uh, and so with the same, we also looking, we are also partners with uh, uh, Cropping to really uh, connect about, uh, you know, 10,626 
uh, VBAs uh, to reach about 3 million farmers in six countries, that is Ghana, Nigeria, Burkina Faso, Mali, Tanzania, and Mozambique. And really the partnership comes in the unprecedented times of COVID-19 when VBA have uh, restricted movement and uh, also unable to you know, train farmers in gathering uh, in a gathering of more than you know two or ten people, because during this ep epidemic, uh, it limits even the number of people uh, who are able to come for training. And so, technology has really been uh, used to be able to continue uh, pushing information to the farmers and uh, uh, helping the farmers also um, access to markets through technology. Uh, the other one is also, uh, you know, enabling mechanization. Uh, to smallholder farmers through uh, the tractor service, uh, uh, Trotro tractors in Ghana, and also a lot tractor in Kenya. Uh, so we work uh, through um, you know a partnership called Financial Inclusion for Smallholder Farmers in African Project, uh, which is implemented together with the Mastercard Foundation uh, to offer mechanization solution you know, to, to farmers uh, um, in, in Africa. So some, those are some of the intervention that we are working on. And I think like when I got in, you know, Shri was talking about uh, the issue of affordability of this technology. We, we know that uh, uh, the uptake of this technology in Africa really uh, would support, uh, you know, uh, any, 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 any solution uh, should be affordable and available. Uh, that is when the farmers can actually see the value of it because uh, you know that the farmers, the smallholder farmers in Africa, isn't disposed to the kind of income that we want to imagine. And so because of this, um, we work with partners who and we encourage them really to look at solutions which are available and also affordable, uh, which the farmers could actually, uh, smallholder farmers could actually use and, and, and check up. And also, more importantly, look at even solutions which are relevant in terms of, uh, uh, you know, solving some of the pain points for farmers. Uh, these solutions then uh, make it very easy for adoptation by the by the by the smallholder farmers. Thank you, uh, Shanton. Thanks, Nixon. I think uh, I will come back with uh, next round in for follow up question. If you can think about that. You work extensively with the government and, and, and many of the government partners. And one of the key things that has been highlighted by Sri Ram and Parmes is the uh, access to data and to the digital services. So think about that, how we can enable those access because those have a pervasive impact on many of these uh, solutions that we are delivering. Uh, you know, moving on to, uh, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Parmes, I think, so you have been the architect of many of the interventions that Saram talked about, and you have been closely, you know, kind of guiding this space towards the next milestones. Uh, you know, thinking of Agriculture 4.0, if you can highlight some of the huge cases, and when I say huge cases, I think if you can give some insight on how these new emerging huge cases can solve some of the problems that are coming into EgTech. For example, are they going to enable a new kind of uh, uh, you know, delivery mechanism, lower the cost, provide a new solution that we are talking about? Something that we can see that, okay, this is on the horizon. In next one or two years, we can look at a new huge cases emerging. And the second uh, part of that, you talked about briefly about the 5G potential, the study you did on the 5G potential. If you can talk more about that, what is going to be you know, uh, unlocked by the forthcoming 5G revolution that we are looking at. So if you can talk about that, that would be very helpful. And then I'll come back to, uh, you know, uh, Sudram for the next uh, question that I uh, think uh, was partially at this. So Sudram, you can think about that. What I'm uh, going to ask you is that, what are the things that you need from the ecosystem to cater to your customers better? I think a few key uh, asks that you can think about. Over to you, Permissa. Thanks, Santosh. And so I think uh, both Sri Ram and Nixon have talked about some of the use cases clearly. So personally, I would give you some examples to get this picture in people's minds so people can visualize that. So a farmer in uh, Africa currently used to get his soil testing reports in a week's time. 
And we have now soil cares working on the million farmer platform with Sri and other people, which allows a sensor to be used, a mobile sensor, so that an extension agent goes with the sensor and puts in there and the soil testing report is available in 10 minutes, basically. You know, it comes to the mobile and the same report goes to the agro dealer who keeps customized fertilizer ready, not a general fertilizer. It's a very customized fertilizer for that farmer, which exactly has analyzed the report and then decides what the combination of fertilizers will be required. To me, that's precision fertilization in that sense. And we are now trying to work with some of the banks so that the moment this report comes, it also goes to a bank and uh, an equity bank and lots of others so that they get credit approvals for that on the spot. So a financial agency comes at the same time, the soil testing comes out, agri input comes at the same time. So basically what I feel is the use case is clearly about bringing so many services which are being offered to a smallholder in a very kind of a dysfunctional and a scattered way being offered in a bundled way to the farmers. And we are also now looking at if we can now design a couriered service delivery to smallholders. If we get couriered products in COVID, we're getting almost every e-commerce thing in a, in a, uh, to every farmer. Now, why doesn't farmer, a smallholder who has to run from pillar to post, to go to the dealer, to get a tractor, gets these services at their doorstep? Similar thing, what Nixon was talking about, Hello Tractor, is the same thing. See, if you had a device fitted on every tractor and you were able to know where the tractor is and what the tractor is able to do, and you had also developed an Uberized kind of an app for smallholder to have an access. Smallholder in every part of the world always gets access to tractor 15 days after the sowing date, basically. By the time getting that service is not very useful because the season has already passed. So if we are able to get a smallholder and access to a tractor before the sowing date or the, the real just-in-time date, we have seen now, and we have seen the data from Hello Tractor and everyone shows that the productivity can go up by almost 25 to 30. And the problem which we have right now with mechanization not being available for smallholders is there. So the biggest thing could change agriculture as a service. You know, you have heard about software as a service, but now it's a question of that smallholder cannot run from pillar to post to get these umpteen number of services, financial service separately, mechanization services separately, soil testing separately. What Agriculture 4.0 does is that it brings all this data at one place and converts into last mile delivery for smallholders in a very different way, in a bundled way. Now, that won't happen just because everyone is developing a separate product. As um, Sriram talked about, we have to bring all these people who are developing point solutions on a platform so that the smallholder gets all these services in, uh, in a real time at a real, in, in a kind of effective way. So I think precision products, precision advisory, all that will come through 5G. So I gave you some examples of how these different products could deliver services in a very different way. So our imagery with agriculture 4.0 is agriculture should be become like a service as opposed to a kind of an, it's a very risky enterprise for a farmer to keep on getting these different services with no control over predictability or something. The second part, which is very important is the weather part, which will become very important because climate is going to become a bigger variable now than ever it has been. So I think this, micro weather observatories, which we are trying to now do, which we are bringing satellite data and, uh, and, and automated uh, weather stations data, and meteorological data together in order to give micro weather prediction to uh, that. And, and we are working now with CALRO, which is the research consortium of Kenya, basically, and helping them digitize the weather data, the crop data, their experiments, and again, making all this data available in a form, in an integrated form, in, in, in real time, as, as uh, Sriram was also saying that if this data is not available at the time when it's required, it's useless. Agriculture is a seasonal activity, basically. So I think removing this time lag between data being collected, analyzed, and uh, feedback being provided and services being provided is the biggest thing for agriculture. If we can remove the unpredictability, we can remove how these data is available in a form 
and data is analyzed and converted into products and services at a much rapid rate. Currently, the product development out of agriculture 4.0 is very slow and still not available to the farmers at the time when they require. So if we bring the satellite data, the weather data, and the crop data, and a lot of other things in real time, and, and I think that's what 4.0 will do. It will increase the intelligence quotient of data for agriculture. Because currently the actionable intelligence, as Sriram was also saying, the percentage of agriculture's actionable intelligence for farmer is hardly 1% or 2%. Now, what agriculture 4.0 does is that improves the proportion of agriculture intelligence, high quality agriculture intelligence with good quality products and services, what, uh, what both Nixon and Sriram in their programs through VBA model and the Agripreneur model are doing. It gets then delivered to a, a, a human touch model basically combined with this actionable insights, and then you deliver services of an infinitely higher quality, basically. So, so I think what is happening now is that there are, in our 5G report, we found that there are almost like 5.8 billion devices being used by farmers. Those devices are not collecting data because they are not designed to collect data. They are designed to provide services. So if if those devices become now data points and you are able to convert that into actionable insights, you get a very different equilibrium coming in there, basically there. And, and the second thing would be that you are doing it in a way that you can even find out what the crop condition is before even the farmer notices, basically. Whether the moisture is there in the crop, whether there is a stress, so that the advisory can talk about when to get the thing. But the biggest change would come if we had something like a unique ID, which you have in India, what happened? And, and every, every household got a unique ID, the payment architecture completely changed. The access to finance and financial inclusion completely changed. We need a unique ID for farmers. It will come through digitization and all. And once you have a unique ID for a farm, so you have a unique ID for farmers, and unique ID for farm. If these two things are, we are able to do across the board as a public good. And so World Bank would like to invest in systems which digitize and do this as a public good. And we talked about the map, which we are trying to see if we can develop a map, uh, like a Google map with, uh, with Google. And if we have these three, four coming in, then you have the foundation, uh, foundational architecture for innovations to blossom. In India, the FinTech innovations after unique ID system came in and a lot of payment platforms came in, you have almost like 10 times or 20 times more innovators developing products and services. So if we have these products with data, actionable intelligence, and integrating this data together into a platform, then you will see a lot of people being able to innovate and products and services. Because innovation is there in Africa. The number of innovators in Africa is very high. Number of innovators in Asia is very high. But access to actionable intelligence is important. But we need to reform the sector so that it is not looked at every farmer doing everything. This is the problem we have right now. Farmer is doing production, farmer is doing marketing. So we need to bring the second tire of agriculture as a service, which I think both Nixon and Shriram have, uh, you know, doing that VBAs and all. If these things come together, but with a digital backbone, basically. If these all these VBAs and all have a digital backbone and uh, agripreneurs have a digital backbone behind them and intelligence, then we can see the next uh, transformation. Over to you, sir. So thanks, sir. I think uh, the, the, some of the key pointers that I'm taking away, one is that you're talking about the integration, the speed and affordability to be brought into the existing offering that we have. So a number of things that we are doing can be integrated, can be made faster and can be made affordable. Uh, but one, you know, just probing question uh, in your 5G, uh, you know, kind of scenarios or, or the case studies that you're visualizing, or in your case, have you seen any platform that helps farmer uh, for better price realization? Is there anything that we are doing that? Because that's one part. We are talking a lot of on the, uh, you know, the production being better, the more productivity enhancing, but what on the price realization front? Is there any insight there? 
So, so clearly, when you see now that if you look at our million farmer platform, we have a number of people who are collecting data systematically about new markets and prices specifically. Now, if a banana farmer in Tanzoya County in Kenya is wants to now know, I am selling banana to a market which is 20 miles away, and she's getting, uh, say, 11 uh, shillings per kg right now for what it is. So what this does is, it, again, it's the intelligence. It brings in market intelligence at the service of smallholder farmers and says, there is a market 30 kilometers down which will pay you 24 uh, shillings per kg. And this is the amount of uh, you know, things you can take there. So uh, then a farmer goes and then explores a new market and also gets higher prices, which currently because they are in a proximate market are not able to go and uh, discover market. So market discovery, price discovery, these two are happening on a large scale. But still the issue is of trust. So that's where blockchain will come. So we will have to develop various, so right now there are, currently there are uh, millions and billions of unenforceable contracts between uh, the farmers, the smallholders, and a lot of people who are buying things, sometimes not even paying them in time, even uh, taking the, the produce and not doing that. So we need an architecture now, which where blockchain will come into picture basically. Because what is blockchain? It's enforceable contracts repeated over a period of time so that there's predictability in the contract and you are able to enforce that. So if we have now, suppose there are uh, people who are buying products and people who are selling products, I see when they come into a blockchain kind of an enforceable contract, we will see again, huge amount of uh, trust in uh, using the market. Currently there is low trust in using the market because of the past experience. Then the other thing which will come together with that is the traceability, which Nixon also referred to what they're trying to do on traceability basically. So traceability is a very big thing. And the consumer is becoming more discerning. You have seen that you know, after COVID, people are very conscious about what they eat and do not eat. So traceability again, uh, we have seen a lot of examples in the 5G um, report that traceability is going to be the second big thing because people would like to know where the product is coming. There's a QR code available for every smallholder, which any consumer is able to see and their confidence in buying their products. And finally, the big uh, you know, thing is the payment. After. I think the currently the payment access to smallholders is still very, very low. You know, only 15% of the smallholders use payment platforms right now. Again, lack of trust. So I would say uh, uh, market intelligence, you know, uh, uh, and uh, then traceability payments. And the final thing would be logistics. We are working in slightly developed contexts in Argentina and Mexico and all to work on a logistics platform also with a lot of truckers and all coming in, whereby the information about where they are and all. So industry doesn't mean only farmers. Industry means processors. Industry means people who are buying products. Industry means people who are transporting products. So when you take the food system perspective, as opposed to the agriculture perspective we have taken in the past, and we just finished a food system summit. And I think that shows clearly that farmers will not benefit if we only work on production, we on agriculture. We have to work on the whole food system as a whole and try to develop these technologies across the board. And once we create a platform across the food system, whereby the agribusiness starts dealing and uh, knows what the traceability is, uh, the, the people who are buying products know what quality products they are going to get. The farmers know whether their contracts will be enforceable and they will get payment in time. So I personally feel the agriculture 4.0 will, will require a high amount of market intelligence, actionable intelligence, data being accessible to a lot of people. I, you can't expect a farmer to access all the data which is available through satellites and all. So we will have to use this data as a public good and a lot of private entrepreneurs developing products and services and uh, delivering these services in a very, very entrepreneurial and a real time kind of way. But, the, but there is a transformation of the sector required so that agriculture is 
considered as a service and there are a lot of service delivery which becomes professional like we have in health like we have in education we are now professional service delivery happening there in agriculture we still expect every farmer to serve itself that i think that that mindset that agriculture farmer has to do everything himself or herself has to completely change and we need to bring the whole ecosystem together to develop a service industry agriculture as a service thank you sir i think this very insightful i would kind of uh, you know uh, for sort of time but i'll ask you to kind of come across if any uh, you know example that you have in the next round of remark about the quality di you know dimension of the produce because a lot of contracts do not get enforced because the quality layer is missing you have the traceability you have the other layers but how to kind of ensure the quality so i'll uh, pick your brain in the next round but moving on to uh, nixon a uh, couple of questions from the audience and the you know i have some of the thing that i want to draw your attention to and get your remark is you know the data and the regulatory framework and the support that is available from the different government is a critical factor in enabling some of the services so when you look at some of the solutions being provided to the farmers uh, what kind of you know uh, regulatory reforms regulatory interventions or data type uh, in a data enablement that you are seeing is there something that we can learn from your experiences that you have uh, working with the more partners yeah yeah thank you very much uh, santosh um uh, i want to say one number one that uh, like like uh, parmesh has said one of the things that this uh, uh, industry 4.0 technologies I have brought is uh, they create the need for uh, a lot of data which 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 is generated uh, so that uh, so that so that um, you know um, uh, so that farm you know the the technology generates a lot of data and and because of the lack of standardization in the format and the ownership of uh, data this create a lot of disparity around how that data which is a result of the our intervention you know the technologies can be you know uh, uh, stored or can be uh, can be protected and so forth so uh, one of the ways that uh, and especially in uh, south africa the south uh, sub saharan african countries one of the ways they have done is 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 to look at how do we uh, manage some of this data that are coming from this technology and a lot of government now have uh, enacted what we call a gdpr which is the, the general you know data protection uh, regulation uh, designed to really bring uh, the protection of personal data for misuse because uh, again when all this data goes out there uh you must have some regulation around how it is going to be managed how it is going to be stored how do you protect the data subject in this case the smallholder farmers uh you know uh, areas like that so many of these countries have um, already enacted um uh, a law uh, a data protection law uh, framework that really are, are meant to you know bring the protection of personal data uh, from misuse um another area that uh, has become you know uh, very important for government uh, uh, particularly is um some of these technologies and adoption of these technologies have also uh, driven uh, government to uh, you know to realize that there's a lot of digital divide among us uh, you know uh, uh citizen uh, a lot of these uh technologies uh have brought out the disparity between the technological the technological haves and have nots and this has actually aided in developing uh, uh you know uh, some of the policies around how do we get to uh so to speak connect the unconnected uh you will be aware that um you know most african countries um have now what we call uh you know the universal service fund uh which is a fund and and which is a fund which is you know 
uh, majorly managed uh, uh, by you know the regulators, the telco regulators, and and the, and the purpose of this fund really is to support you know widespread access to uh, you know ICT services because again uh, industry 4.0 technology uh, would require that the infrastructure, especially where the farming is get, get, uh, taking place and that is a rural area are connected for example uh, in kenya for instance you know um uh, some of this uh, technology has resulted in a, the amendment of the kenya Com uh, communication amendment act of 29 that now provides uh, you know the establishment of uh, a universal service fund and also a universal service advisory uh, council uh, where I I had a, I, I had I had um, uh, an opportunity to serve, and our major role then was to you know use this fund to really uh, support the widespread of ICT services and also promote capacity building and innovation around uh, ICT services within uh, you know the country. Uh, so, so some of these uh, uh, you know, uh, interventions have really uh, informed, uh, so to speak, for uh, governments to to really come up with uh, uh, you know um, policies uh, that are, uh, um, uh, are informed by 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 by, by some of these interventions that uh, have come forth. Uh, thank you, Sandra. And I think that uh, you know highlights the need for the infrastructure that is needed for delivering those services and the right kind of policy regime and regulations. Uh, Siram, I think I hinted at the question that I want you to answer is that you know in order to kind of make this impact at a scale, you need the support from the ecosystem uh, that enables you to deliver those services uh, and the things. So, but there's a question from the audience also. So I. Uh, you know, have two part remark from you. One talking about what you see as the ecosystem that is needed to support you, and second, you know, there are questions that are talking about. Uh, you know, apart from this delivery through the entrepreneurs, the agriculture entrepreneurs, are you looking at any other models of providing these technologies in different parts of the world? So, I will request you to answer these two, and uh, I want to kind of uh, get to the next round and ask uh, Pramesh to answer one question that you know. We talked about a number of uh, solutions, a number of innovations happening in Africa. And if we had to rely on the 4.1 you know, region, we need lots of entrepreneur delivering services and achieving a scale. So what is kind of his vision, what he's working on that dimensions of 4.0, how support 4.0 uh, agriculture entrepreneurs to achieve this scale? So uh, I'll start with uh, Sudram and then um, go to uh, uh, Pramesh. Yeah, thanks, Santosh. Let me take the ecosystem question first. So there is a saying in Africa that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. And if you want to go far, go together. And that's the apt expression for ecosystem. Right, so like Parmesh uh, spoke about bundling of the services. So if you now look at the ecosystem at large, as Kuza, we've actually been championing and working closely with our partners to create a model which we are calling is as a PPP and a P model. That is public sector, philanthropy sector, and private sector working closely towards a common objective on a one common platform. So that's the PPP, public philanthropy, private platform. Now that's, that's something that we figured out and we said, let public sector concentrate and focus on the global good and data protection, governance and overall a favorable policy framework, while the philanthropy sector has a much bigger role to play because what we are talking of is this unstructured, informal markets. We need a lot of philanthropy and developmental resources to bootstrap and uplift this. Expecting a private sector to do this is a non-starter. So philanthropy sector contributing towards either creation of these agripreneurs, VBAs, or any such support model that is needed to bootstrap and get this up and running. And the private sector plays a role. For private sector, the advantage is like in the case of Kenya, which Parmesh was speaking about, World Bank's investment in two major projects called Nadiq and KSAT have already mobilized 1.1 million farmers, grouped them into common interest groups, vulnerable marginalized groups, and producer organizations. 
and invested heavily in bringing that together and digitizing them. So that big data is already available. Now, for private sector, the cost of acquisition of a customer goes down because that heavy lifting is already done with the public good. Now, this is where entrepreneurship and innovation needs to come in. And that's what we are now championing and doing it is as ecosystem, as startups, and as innovators, we're all now looking at it from different dimensions. This is where the point solutions are coming. Call it soil testing, call it mechanization services, call it uh, using UAVs, drones, or any such thing. By bringing all of that together, leveraging the already existing public good, we are now reducing the cost of acquisition of customers, but increasing the scalability side of it. This is where private sector is now making investments or has a potential to make investments in processing, post-harvest handling, the entire stuff after the production and beyond and going to the market. That's where the value ticket size is increasing. And the whole idea is to capture all of these interactions, transactions, and value on one platform, which is what we're calling as one network. One network is our response to bringing together all the ecosystem actors so that we all work towards one common goal and one common good. And this is where I personally believe we can actually change the arithmetic of one plus one can actually become 11. Now, talking about the second question, yes, agripreneur model is what we are very passionately and consciously working on. Yes, we already have the technology capabilities as Kuzar to open it up for over the air using apps and using WhatsApps and all the distribution channels. That's something that we are already doing as a direct acquisition channels. But we strongly believe that the only way we can change the narrative and make a difference is by creating more and more agripreneurs. That's That as a model, the more and more we think about it, it's going to check so many, many boxes simply because it's making unemployed rural youth relevant. We are actually creating agriculture as a service. Parmesh, uh, thanks for that insight. I mean, that's a fantastic perspective of looking at agriculture as a service. And I think this is where by using digital technologies at the core and by bringing private sector to the table with the resources and investments with both public and philanthropy sector, we can bring youth back into agriculture. And this is where the narrative is going to change and it's already changing. And with African continent, with majority being youth, I think this is a blessing in disguise. Over to you, Santosh. Thank you. And I think this is a very nice segue to the question that I have for uh, Parmesi. You know, I think we have got the solutions, we have the vision, uh, but some of the keywords I'm picking from what Siram told, the private sector capital, the, you know, the scale up, the different entrepreneurs coming together, the different kind of roles the World Bank has played. So you know, if we have to summarize the next four or five years of the EgTech revolution to go to the next level, we are talking about identifying the right solution, providing them the right ecosystem, making them scale and bring the private capital when it is kind of in the, uh, you know, in the right shape and, and kind of right stage of their growth. So uh, Pramesh, you have been talking about the ecosystem approach or bringing all these stakeholders together, be the World Bank, the private sector lending arm of IFC, bring the philanthropic capital, bring the incubator, et cetera, together. So how do you see the whole vision, you know, kind of shaping up for next four or five years? Uh, for transforming the uh, egg tech or the industry 4.0 and, and agriculture 4.0. Thanks, Santosh. And I think uh, both Nixon and Sriram alluded to some of the things which I'm going to talk about. But I think clearly for future, we have to increase the intelligent uh, and uh, intelligence quotient of data. Because we are data access is now very much possible and we have invested in this data being available. But as Nixon rightly says, there are data governance, farmer ownership, a lot of things required there because so that otherwise you have some uh, people staying with the data and the farmers are, can be taken for a right, right there, basically. So I think we have to create uh, what I would call is a data governance architecture where farmers get paid for data. So we are looking at a designing something called data vouchers for farmers because if they give data, they should get an equivalent of service uh, available to them. So data would be very interesting. Second is that we need to create a kind of a sandbox for actionable intelligence from data. Currently, data doesn't get converted into actionable in insights on its own. So we need to create some kind of a invest in that kind of a platform which allows it to be. And that will not be done 
purely by World Bank or only startups. You'll have to bring data companies and uh, you know technology companies in that in that kind of an alliance. And that's where we are trying to work with. Not the, the, the main part of Google doesn't work with us. It's a mineral X, which is a venture part of Google, which is taking more risk and developing a Google Map kind of a product, is working with us. So we need new kinds of products which don't look at it just incremental kind of a thing. So the actionable intelligence, how does data get converted into intelligence? How does data get converted into precision intelligence? That will be the investment we will be doing more in future. And I still I agree with both Sriram and Nixon that this is still going to be a public good investment because I don't think smallholders on their own will have the wherewithal to have actionable intelligence. We will have to create a sandbox. We are currently talking to Central Bank of Kenya now of, of developing a sandbox to allow this to develop in upstream kind of way in a different way. The second is the kind of investments we are trying to do to bring the counties and uh, innovators together. And I think uh, Sri Ram and all the 24, 25 people are really almost on a, I see that almost on a monthly basis, they are uh, signing agreements with counties. So basically the innovation coefficient of agriculture will increase significantly if we are going to develop this public uh, private kind of platform with innovators and each county has then innovation partners in every county. So it's a, it's like a, it's not a it's not a kind of a you know overnight kind of a thing. There's a lot of facilitation required to bring these people together. So that's convening, convening, facilitating, uh, data analytics and actionable intelligence, and then the ecosystem. Like we are now working with government of Ethiopia on developing a roadmap for next five years currently, digital agriculture roadmap. And you see, Kenya has much higher uh, density and intensity of you know, innovators and entrepreneurs. Ethiopia does not have that. So how do we do that in a country like Ethiopia to create, uh, you know, incubators there for new people in Ethiopian ecosystem to come in and in reach the same amount of intensity and density there. The second would be to bring in uh, people from other parts of the world to Ethiopia. Because this, personally, I feel that if we think that this uh, work on agriculture 4.0 will happen only with indigenous startups, it won't happen. So that's why what Nixon is doing by bringing crop in and all in is a very important thing. Because crop in has the wherewithal right now to go to many countries. We are working with them in many countries now. So they are able to bring the actionable intelligence and data analysis of a higher order. Uh, rather than we doing it in an incremental way, we can do it in a disruptive way. So two things uh, I think will be required. Uh, one, we will have to invest in a data platform. So we are now uh, going to launch a global agriculture food system data observatory. We are bringing 14 data providers on one platform and they will share uh, uh, data in a public platform. There will be some confidential computing you can do because I think you require some confidential computing for people to be able to develop products and services. But still we feel that if the 12 major data sources in the world come together to create one platform and including uh, you know this uh, google and all then we will be able to develop an open access data platform which will lead to the next agriculture for kind of innovation there the second would be the sandbox for uh, you know developing new products and services based on this actionable data and even uh, really doing more work on agriculture as a service kind of a thing. And third will be the kinds of platforms at the country level we are talking about. So we are looking at that every World Bank project should invest in a structure like a million farmer platform. So when we started investing early on, these projects were there, which Shira mentioned. So we retrofitted these projects to include data and digital component. But a new project which we are going to launch in the next three months, the National Agriculture Value Chain Project in about 11 uh, value chains, will from day one include a data and digital component. It will make almost 30 to 40 million investment in data and digital as part of an IDA investment. plan. And we are going to do this in 26 countries globally. So we keep on investing about $6 billion annually in agriculture and food projects. But we don't have strong data and digital and components that we are talking about in every project. So we are now trying to see if 10% of every investment we do, the physical and the other things, 
which we do in farmer organizations, we at least invest 10% in data and digital. We feel that investment should spur other kinds of investments. We are trying to also develop a specific enabler fund with IFC right now, basically to see if we can develop a unique fund, an enabler fund for IFC also together with that. So I think there is still a lot of work to be done, but uh, I personally feel that uh, it requires uh, ecosystem building as an activity. And I think it is difficult because, you know, we, we lend money to governments. Governments don't want to borrow from us for ecosystem building. That's a fact of life. Because government want to invest in more the physical facilities and other things, which are, you know, obviously that gets converted to political capital much faster. So data and digital investments, as Shiram rightly said, will come through hybrid models, which will include, uh, you know, public resources, uh, you know, uh, what I will call is patient capital and philanthropic capital, and then ultimately private capital. There. So I think we are still far away from a point where a lot of private capital will flow into this. But I think we have to develop some sandbox arrangements so that people know how this can be done. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I think uh, the takeaway is that uh, you are looking at enabling the solution and then providing an opportunity to build the solution in the sandbox. And then what I'm hearing is that you are also looking to bring the uh, capital to scale up the solution. So if we have to summarize in, in this way. Uh, you know, I'm moving on to some of the questions that I have from the audience. Uh, uh, and and Pradeep, you can also uh, see the question in the chat box and respond to that. But one question that I have quickly for Nixon. Nixon, I think a uh, question was uh, from the audience that uh, you talk about the solutions uh, for the farmers. Uh, you know, uh, is there a way that you engage the farmers in the development of solutions? So are the farmers are also kind of uh, part of the solution development? A quick response. I think I answered on the on the chat, but uh, um, just to add, I mean, if, if uh, experience is that if you work with the you know um, farmers, you know uh, number of farmers or focus group of farmers, uh, sometimes you get more uh, uh, you know more uh, information on 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 their issues rather than just you know developing a solution out of uh, the blues. So um, I, I answered it on the chat, but just to go to what um, uh, Pramesh has said, which is very important, I think, is 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 really the issue of uh, um, looking at data as a public good and 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 how we innovate around that data, uh, you know, to to help us uh, reach out to the farmers. For me, is very critical, and and also the issue, of, you know. Partnership. Um, currently, we are actually just designing a partnership with the United Nations, you know, uh, um, Capital De De Development Fund, to look at how can we uh, one uh, explore collaboration uh, venues uh, for African entrepreneurs and Indian uh, agri tech and agri fintech startups to jointly work on use cases uh, you know together and, and and we are actually you know uh, you know just exploring this kind of partnership and, and i think this kind of partnership really works because uh, one of the things that you realize is that then the, the the developers and the solution providers can actually work together to see how best they can address some of these issues uh, around uh, smallholder farmers and what their pain points is. There's some noise coming out of uh, someone, I think. But anyway, yes, uh, also engaging on sharing, you know, regional um, or sector domain insights through sessions, events, and even webinars like this help to, you know, kind of understand where uh, are the challenges that the farmers face, even in the use of technology. Because one of the things that you uh, you will see the some of the challenges that uh, affect actually all farmers it, 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 it is that you know um, uh, when you bring a farmer uh, a new technology, some of the uh, the farmers would not uh, embrace it in the first place because of the issues around trust. Uh, you know, uh, like 
I think uh, I got in when somebody was saying there's, there's so much technology available uh, and some have not been able to scale or sustain themselves. And therefore, uh, some of these farmers have in the past been um, subjected to some of these technologies which did not really go far. So when you bring a new technology to the farmers, sometimes there is a lot of issues of trust. Can we trust this technology? Is it the, like the one that uh, we were introduced to before? Uh, and so we need to build um, our solution around a lot of trust for the farmers. They need to uh, you know, see value in, in what they are, what, what, what we are pushing to them. If they don't see value, then the adoption uh, can be very little and, and, and there's a lot of issues of uh, uh, rejection also uh, uh, around that. Uh, then permit me also to, to speak about uh, 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 some of the things that I, I, I think uh, could also be very important in, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, uh, you know, uh, from the government perspective, you know, uh, I think for, 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 for government, especially in uh, Africa, for the two, the four or two, you know, uh, 4.2, 4.0 um, uh, uh, te uh, technology, I think government needs to make deliberate uh, effort to uh, have policies and programs that enable some of this system and infrastructure to, 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 to strive because uh, the, the fact that uh, this technology is, is here, we, 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 we as Africans should not be able to miss out on this. And, and one of the very key and critical uh, issue is that the government needs to come up and really uh, look at how do we uh, uh, enable the environment for some of these uh, technologies really to pick up and, uh, uh, and, 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 and provide that environment for, for them to strive. Uh, the, other, the, other, the other one is also that, uh, you know, uh, when, when you're looking at uh, addressing, you know, div uh, digital divide, uh, policy must, uh, you know, uh, uh, prioritize, uh, policy must be prioritized. Uh, and really government also must come up to, to look at how do we um, support, you know, smallholder farmers, uh, both in farms and also uh, what, of course, are my, 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 the other speakers have talked about, the potential private sector investment uh, promotion, you know, um, uh, public and private sector coming together to make sure that uh, uh, this agriculture 4.0 really works uh, for us. And, and therefore, I think it, it, it is very critical that uh, um, apart, of, apart from just talking about it, that we, may, we can be deliberate in really uh, supporting, um, you know, this, uh, uh, the policies, the frameworks that would enable this workout. And also, like um, uh, I think Shri said, uh, importantly is to look at how do we uh, come together and say, can we actually have one network that produces most of these, uh, you know, solutions for all the farmers, so that it is not uh, uh, some of these intervention are not really siloed, but uh, are coming together for the benefit of farmers and 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 then make greater impact uh, for agriculture in Africa. Thank you. So next, I think thanks for uh, explaining that. I think I have a couple of questions. I'm going into the uh, you know the very sought answer page where uh, you know. Uh, but one question which particularly you know kind of I want uh, Parmes and uh, you know Suram to kind of answer it's from uh, Bopin saying what role can investor play to realize 4.0 uh, specifically when it comes to bonding services to improve customer value and bringing together data streams coming from different services. Would a startup merger facility be an approach to consider? And what could, uh, you know, what role could larger players like telcos play? So they are saying that if you're talking about convergence of multiple kind of data sources, multiple services, uh, do investors have a role to play or telcos have a role to play? Uh, a quick response from Parmes and then from Saram uh, uh, on this. 
So you clearly have in Kenya, Safaricom has a Digifarm platform where it's tried to bring these people together and, and, and create a platform because it's already there. Its presence, if you look at, it has an Ampasa payment system in every corner of Kenya. Mm -hmm. And so it makes strategic sense to have an outreach model. Which, but what it requires, is ecosystem uh, building requires trust. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so when we started working in 2019, we wanted to work with Digifarm only at that stage. But we realized that, that you required multiple kind of approaches at that stage that stage and so a lot of uh, people who were developing that had an apprehension that telecom company will guzzle them you know and uh, will not let them develop and so i think that's the reason why we are not at a stage where there is trust still between them but still i feel that uh, we are now uh, ethiopia has now just given a license of new telecom license after a long time to vodafone and we are going mm -hmm. to try to work with Vodafone so that we bring in this whole thinking uh, and, and, uh, and from day one in how they should develop that. Uh, so merger can't be mandated because, you know, a lot of yeah. startups are not monetized yet, basically. We are, we are almost all of them are at, uh, you know, uh, stage A, you know, and, and, and if you were already at stage B, merger can take place. But if you are, if you have a lot of big pipeline at stage A, you need to let them develop the product up to a certain scale and quality. But I feel that the kind of approach we are developing of like a consortium right now, which Shriram is working with almost eight or nine other players right now, He's working in a co-production kind of way. And I think that's producing better outcomes for smallholders right now, rather than one monopoly provider. Doing. We also mm -hmm. work with a number of e-commerce companies, right? Like Pinto Duo in China and all. And we are trying to make sure that one company does not dominate that and, and develops some, what we call is now with Rockefeller, we are looking at something called allogarithmic justice for smallholder farmers. <laughs> so it's like we need something because otherwise smallholder farmers will be taken for a six, basically <laughs> by these large e-commerce companies and all. So yeah, I think yeah. we need a good balance between the two. I still believe in this that we should create a large pipeline of startups in Africa and really provide a sandbox environment for them to grow so that this remains, uh, the digital divide doesn't get accentuated further. Because that's what uh, keeps me, uh, as, uh, I don't get sleep because I feel that whatever we are doing should not lead to further digital divide. So I think, I think we need to do a lot of enablers before we go into that. I'll stop there, thank you. So Ram, you want to add to what Parmesh said? Yeah, Santosh, I really love this algorithmic justice uh, thing. Uh, but but on, a, on a serious note, I think as Parmesh alluded, uh, the power of small players, the agility and the nimbleness and the flexibility that they bring to the table is something that's a need of the art. I mean, if we can always connect the dots by looking backwards, like if you see the Android and the Play Store ecosystem, Today, somebody with an idea created an app and making it available for a dollar. And he's, he or she has a potential to make multi-million dollars as long as it got a product market fit. I mean, that's a classic thing that we can learn and borrow from there and create a level playing field opportunity. Just because you are a small player doesn't mean you can't compete with a large uh, multinational company, right? But yeah, as long as you have the power, and this is where the ecosystem thinking and we have an opportunity to shape this narrative. And this is where I think we are at the cusp of the time where agriculture food auto is being shaped. And this time around, I think we can learn from the past mistakes when I say we as an industry at large, and then see how we can make it a win-win-win proposition for all. By not forgetting that the farmer is a customer and end of the day, farmer has to increase the productivity and make an extra buck. Thanks, Santosh. So Thank you. I think uh, uh, just, uh, you know, kind of before we close a couple of thoughts, I think uh, we have been lucky to work with World Bank to look at some of the problems ourselves. We are trying to see how the technologies from, you know, the developed world can go to the developing nations and, and create a change. And I think uh, uh, Parmesh talked about the sandbox approach, but I would say that if the sandbox approach can also add a layer of trust that, okay, if we are offering something from this sandbox uh, ecosystem, it has a trust layer built on that so that people can start kind of creating some kind of, you know, uh, branding around the trust would be a good idea to give the farmer a bit of comfort they're coming from a well-vetted source. 
Uh, and, and the second part, I think, uh, you know, which we all have been talking about, the nimbleness of the small land or uh, small solution providers, small businesses, uh, you know, kind of is, is very, very critical, especially serving to a very diverse kind of, uh, you know, ecosystem and geography. But the key is that how we can make these, you know, uh, small businesses read the skill that they deserve because they are not supposed to remain small. They are supposed to grow. And, and how they would, you know, if they are supposed to grow, how they can. So uh, for us, I think, uh, uh, you know, I'll give uh, one last minute to each of you. Uh, I think we are already running out of time. So, so just one word, if you have to focus on agriculture 4.0, what would be the things? Just one word, not even a sentence. One word uh, from Sidram, what is the focus for you in agriculture 4.0? One or two words. It is going to be a business model innovation, investment, technology, what could be? From your uh, thinking, collaboration. Okay, uh, Nixon. What is your keyword for making this four point two happen? You are on mute. Two words. I'll break the rule. Okay. Collaboration and the right investment. Okay, so you only added one more. So collaboration <laughs> and right investment. I, uh, you know, you did not break the rule. So uh, coming back to uh, Parmes. What is the keyword that you are focusing that both Agra and you know Puja guys can think of that this is something that uh, is going to solve the problem? So one word or probably two words or three words if you include the other two words into that mix. I will use a phrase, uh, invest in agriculture as a service. Okay, so agriculture as a service, collaboration and the right investment. I know that that's what we are taking away. But thank you very much for uh, you know making time for this session. It has been immensely informative and kind of setting the tone for the discussion that we are going to see in Agriculture 4.0. Uh, from Sankal team, very very you know uh, thank you for all of the participants and the panelists. And uh, Agriculture Tech Agriculture 4.0 is the conversation that we are championing in Global South with many partners. We look forward to have this conversation again and again and, and, and kind of unlock newer dimensions and focus on that. But for us, the key part is that uh, agriculture 4.0 is going to be very, very critical if we have to preserve the productivity of our farms and make them more resilient. I think it's not a, going to be something that we need to have. It is must now because the uh, the quote that I have been using, 30 to 40% of our productivity is going to hit by climate change and many other factors. So this is something that we need to do that. On this thing, I think we look at the promise of agriculture 4.0 in making the agriculture productive and resilient. Uh, wish you a very, very you know, uh, happy rest of the day. And we look forward to having you on the other session. So thank you very much. Thanks, Santosh. And thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Sudan. Thank you, Nixon. Judge Nixon and Sriram, very good to be with you on this panel. Thank, thank you, you very so much, much. Thank also, you. and Shiram. Bye. Very good to be with you in this panel. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Nixon. Thanks, Parmesh. Bye. Bye. Bye.